And I know that many of you joined from other regions um, and it's a pleasure to have you here today. Uh, so for those that I've not met before, my name is Alison McLean and I work at AIA Australia in our behavioural science team. And myself, along with the rest of the Australian Behavioural Science Committee, um, have organised a really great speaker um, for you this evening, um, certainly one that I'm super excited about. So I want to introduce you to Dr. Michelle uh, John Janellis. She's a professor at the University of Melbourne, an associate professor at the University of Melbourne. She's a deputy director at the University of Melbourne Centre for Behaviour Change, um, which launched some time ago, but had an official launch earlier this year, which I had the pleasure of attending. Um, it was a fantastic event. She's a clinical psychologist um, with experience in health promotion, intervention development, evaluation and behavioural science, and works across multiple and diverse health-related behaviours, including alcohol and tobacco control. Um, and this is a super great, super exciting topic uh, that Michelle's going to talk about today. Um, we met Michelle a couple of months ago and asked her to join uh, the Behavioural Science Network event um, to talk about all the work that she's been doing in terms of uh, vaping and e-cigarettes and how the different environments and systems impacts on behaviours that we see in relation to vaping. At that time, the landscape was quite different, um, at least in, in Australia. Um, and we've seen over the last month, some, the government announced some intentions to make some pretty dramatic changes in terms of how we regulate um, importation and the distribution of vaping in Australia. So for me, this is a fantastic time to have Michelle here to talk about, well, what actually impacts on behaviour or what do we think impacts on behaviour in terms of vaping and um, e-cigarettes? And, and also, what do we think some of these changes that the government announced in the last month might have in terms of in terms of behaviour. So thank you so much for joining us, Michelle. A pleasure to have you here. Um, and I'm gonna hand over to you um, and then we'll wrap up at the end. Um, Merle is gonna do a bit of Q&A. Uh, so thanks very much. And you can pop the questions um, into the chat or we can ask them at the end as well. Thanks, Michelle. Awesome, thank you. So while I share my screen and then hit the presentation wanting to wish everyone a world no tobacco day so it's actually probably quite serendipitous that i'm presenting today uh which is world no tobacco tobacco day 31st of may every year um so if you've been on linkedin you would see there's probably lots of lots of stuff happening around australia around um you know what it means in terms of not just in australia for tobacco control but around the world it's a world health organization event that that happens every year so Thank you so much for joining. So today I am going to chat through a particular public health menace that has been identified in, in recent years. Well, I mean, recent years, I guess it's become part of the, 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 the broader environment, but I've been doing this work since about 2017. So um, I'll go into sort of that uh, now. Um, but before I launch into it, I do want to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands on which I am making this presentation. And uh, you can all also acknowledge the lands on which you are perhaps situated right now. So I'm going to start with a timeline just to sort of orient everyone. I'm not going to start from the beginning of time. I'll start from uh, 2012, which is when tobacco plain packaging legislation passed. Um, the reason I'm starting with 2012 is, and plain packaging is because that is the last biggest um, public health tobacco control innovation reform that happened, right? So that was over a decade ago. Um, I attended the, the 10th anniversary of it last year and nothing's been done since. So that's why we're starting with tobacco plain packaging. In 2013, we noticed there was massive investment in e-cigarettes by Big Tobacco. So they've been around for a little while. They were developed um, a couple of decades ago in, in China by a, a guy called Hon Leek, who, um, you know, made these products because uh, his parents were suffering from the effects of, of cigarettes and he wanted to sort of reduce the harm. Um, but, you know, so, so they've always been in the background um, for a few decades at least. But 2013 was really when Big Tobacco started to diversify and get into this space. In 2017, uh, my work in this space began. Um, so you know, there was a bit of, not much work, to be honest, had been done in Australia. Um, we did notice, though, that the NHMRC CEO came out with a statement on e-cigarettes. So that was sort of, I guess, a, a quite a big, uh, a big deal. And then in uh, 2018, we had the first federal inquiry into this matter. 
um, we it was essentially a dissenting report. So, you know, we had the, the major report, which was these products are harmful. And then we had um, two politicians who wrote a dissenting report believing that these products were fine. In 2020, we had a second federal inquiry. Um, so a theme you'll notice is lots of inquiries, but not much action. So 2020, we had a second federal inquiry, uh, also produced a dissenting report. So of the five senators who were involved in that, uh, three wrote the report saying that, you know, these products are very harmful and we need to do, you know, we can't legalise them. We need to be doing more to protect Australians. Uh, and we had two senators who wrote a dissenting report. Um, I'll get into this later, but the two senators who wrote the dissenting report, one of them was a, a Nationals member. The Nationals are funded by Big Tobacco. And the other one is very good friends with um, the tobacco control sort of lobby. And uh, I'll, again, I'll get into that later. 2021, Greg Hunt floated the idea of importation bans. So importing, banning the imports of e-cigarettes. There was a backbencher revolt. Um, so we sort of ended up in this position where we then had the TGA's consultation on nicotine rescheduling and product standards. So we didn't quite get that import ban that we were hoping for um, to appease people who had to do the consultation. So that's what we ended up with. And we noticed that disposables then hit the market in 2021. In 2022, at that um, 10th anniversary of plain packaging that I uh, was uh, was at last year in, in Canberra, uh, Minister Butler announced some major tobacco control reforms. So again, the first major reform since plain packaging. And then in 2023, we had the TGA's most recent consultation on, again, specifically around e-cigarette product standards this time. So there was no question about the prescription model, but it was around, you know, what can we do, what can we be doing around these devices because, you know, the, the current system wasn't working. And this resulted then in the announcement of the vaping reforms that everyone would have seen happened very early in May. Um, and I believe Minister Butler uh, spoke about those reforms again today and noted sort of a, a date of, of April 2024 for potentially implementing those reforms and talked about 300 pages of legislation, which I very much look forward to reading. So when I talk about e-cig reforms, what am I talking about? These are the reforms that are being tabled. So the first one is the ban on the importation and sale of non-prescription vaping products, including those that don't contain nicotine. Now, the reason that reform is bolded is because that was the one that we said absolutely had to be done if we were to get control of what's happening in Australia with the black market and illegal distribution of these products, right? So there were other reforms or, or that were slated in the consultation, like the restricting flavours, uh, pharmaceutical-like packaging, reducing nicotine content, uh, the concentration to 20 milligrams. So it's currently up to 100 is allowed, which is five times the legal limit that's allowed in, in Europe and in, in the UK, where these products are consumer goods. So we wanted to reduce that to, to 20, um, which is consistent with other areas in the world, and a ban on the single-use disposable ones. And we said to them, look, if you want to restrict flavours, if you want to do the packaging, you know, do it but we don't support introducing these measures and not introducing that first one. These measures are going to do absolutely nothing if these products are still being allowed into the country to begin with. And luckily they listen to us. And so we have a ban on the importation of non-prescription vaping products. And the other critical thing here was this includes those that don't contain nicotine. So a problem with the whole nicotine, non-nicotine distinction is that we don't know whether the actual device contains nicotine or not. So to bypass the laws, we have uh, distributors, sellers, you know, however you want to call them, mislabeling their products deliberately, saying something doesn't have nicotine when it does, uh, which is obviously hugely problematic. And also it's not just nicotine that's really dangerous in these products. It's a whole bunch of other things, which I'll go into. So, sorry, I talk really, really fast when it comes to e-cigs. Please, someone tell me to slow down if I have to. Um, why? Why have we done this? So you've all seen increasing rates of e-cigarette use, particularly among youth. So we've heard from teachers, we've got parents, you know, certainly between 2013 and 2019, we saw a tripling in use among youth. Uh, we haven't got the latest figures yet uh, because COVID threw out all our monitoring, but we are expecting to see even greater numbers uh, for youth. But there's also limited evidence of cessation benefit. Um, so, you know, these products 
haven't been submitted to the Therapeutic Goods Administration for independent assessment. Um, you know, I'm a cynic. So, you know, it makes me wonder why. And, you know, we suspect that it's because the industry knows that these products are not going to pass that independent assessment. Um, so they'd much rather, you know, push for a consumer model where they don't have to worry about efficacy, quality, safety. Obviously, as well, there are health harms associated with this, and uh, there's a gateway to smoking. So I'll go through a few of these in turn. Apologies if you know all this information already. So like I said, tripling of use between 2013 and 2019, and we are expecting the data from the uh, latest national health survey very, very soon, hopefully in the next few months. But we know that recent studies um, conducted outside of the national monitoring have actually found that 14% of 50 to 30 year olds were current users and 33% had tried or used in the past. So this pro-vaping narrative, and, and I was up in Brisbane yesterday presenting evidence at the um, Queensland government's inquiry into reducing vaping rates. And, you know, they had some people from the other side present their argument and they were saying you know kids who use they're just experimenting they'll just try it once or twice and then they'll stop now the data suggests otherwise so this whole idea that most kids are just ex exper experimenting and very few will become current users is false because I think that 14 percent of kids using is not a minuscule amount I would obviously hope that zero percent of kids are using um, but you know we really need to to reduce that narrative that this is just experimentation and we've got nothing to worry about in terms of why then kids are using so that's a question I get asked a lot why are we seeing these huge rates among youth uh, particularly when theoretically it's illegal um, but you know also why are kids even finding this interesting and you know we've sort of talked here about marketing that spans the, the four p's so place price promotion and product so in terms of place here are some examples of uh, advertising that happens on social media platforms. That's the big place where kids are being exposed to these uh, these products. So we've got TikTok, Instagram, um, Snapchat, places where you and I aren't, we're not on these. So we're not seeing what the kids are seeing. And even if we are on things like TikTok or Snapchat, the algorithms aren't showing us what they're showing the kids. So, um, you know, social influencers in particular are being used. They are being paid by industry to promote these products as well. And very often they are not saying that it is a sponsored post. Um, so that's an example of place. In terms of price, We've noticed, you know, obviously with cigarettes, it's it's illegal for, for this to happen. But with e-cigs, there's no such law. So we are seeing, you know, buy, buy two, get one free, 50% off discounts, mystery juice bundles, you know, super cheap. Um, buy three bottles and get 15% off your e-liquid. Use this coupon code. That's just not allowed for cigarettes. But it is allowed for um, e-liquids and e-cigarettes at the moment at least. Here's an example of a disposable product, an iGet, which is a, a popular product in Australia. Um, I'm talking about price, but obviously, you know, you can see that this product has cartoons and is colourful. So this is a product with 5,000 puffs of um, cigarettes. It's made with salt nick. So what that means, it's not a free-based nicotine. It's a salt-based nicotine, which is even more addictive and more palatable for children. Uh, 5,000 puffs per disposable. And you can expect to pay about 20 bucks for this. Um, you know, it can be on sale for cheaper than that, but between 20 and 30 bucks, you can get 5,000 puffs. So, you know, this is when people ask me, well, hang on, how can kids even afford it? It's not that expensive. Then we got promotion. So here are some um, things, uh, some descriptors, descriptors of um, various products that I found online. So the watermelon I get B5000 is invigoratingly juicy. It's got that sweet, ripe watermelon taste, but with a cool and icy kick. Or this one, it exudes elegance, range of pristine flavors, ergonomic mouthpiece, crafted from premium quality plastic to maintain the integrity of all the flavors to an exceptional level. And here's some example of, you know, um, ads clearly directed towards uh, youth, very bright, young protagonists, and the device itself um, in terms of the USB stick. 
Here's some more promotion on that initial inhale. A feeling of calmness washes over you. Mouth-watering blackberries to soak into your tongue. It's bright, sharp, bold, tangy. Once it's time to exhale, a powerful surge of icy, icy menthol washes over you. It's a truly amazing flavor. You'll love it. As you pull the QV bar through your lips, the crisp notes of watermelon tease your tongue so your whole mouth quivers with joy. So you can see the sort of language that they're using here. I mean, it, it's, it's easy to see why kids and adults are, are being um, are, find this appealing. What we also know about promotion is that it's mirroring the, the stuff that, that came out back in the 50s, 60s with tobacco. So here's a comparison of um, Lucky Strike cigarettes to blue electronic cigarettes. And then moving on to product now, this is what they look like. Right, they look like they've got car they've got cartoons on it. They come in lots of different colors. They're very sleek. They're very compact. Um, but also, you know, it's not just the colors. It's it's the stealth vaping that's um, concerning us. And I'll get into that in a few moments. Um, so here are some uh, e-liquid um, product packaging. So in that first picture on the on the top left, I mean, it's it's almost like what's what's a vape product versus what's a lolly. We really can't tell the difference there. And these products are actually being sold in, you know, the new American lolly stores that are popping up, certainly here in Melbourne. Unicorn cakes, bubble gum, looks like milk cartons. You really can't tell the difference between whether it's apple juice or apple flavoured e-liquid. And then with product, this is where it gets, it starts getting even more concerning. So a hoodie on the left that contains a, a mouthpiece for vaping. And this, what looks like to be a legitimate asthma inhaler is actually a vape. So stop getting those disapproving looks when you try to self-medicate in public by taking your medicine with the asthma inhaler vaporizer. It's ideal for dry blends and concentrates and this pocket size vape is your key to discreetly high times. So we noticed this and uh, we definitely reported it to the TGA uh, to make sure that this, um, you know, wouldn't, wouldn't happen in Australia. But these products can still be purchased online. I think that's worth noting. You might not be able to purchase it in Australia, but you can purchase it online and currently import it. So that's why we're seeing increased vaping rates in youth. Now I'll just quickly move on to the limited evidence of cessation benefit. And I think, you know, it's important to point out here because we often get this criticism thrown at us about how we're forgetting the, we're forgetting the smokers. Um, you know, we don't doubt that there are people out there who have successfully quit smoking with vaping. We know that, that's, that those people exist. Um, if we more look at the population level as a, you know, in terms of what is the net benefit versus net cost. So this review conducted by Emily Banks published recently in the Medical Journal of Australia found that there is limited evidence, which is, you know, at this point in time, the best we can do, that free based nicotine e-cigarettes with clinical support is more efficacious for assisting smoking cessation than nicotine replacement therapy or no intervention. Right. So that's what we've got. And this is no more than 20 milligrams per mil. Insufficient evidence for nicotine e-cigarettes in other areas. Insufficient evidence of non-nicotine e-cigarettes being good for smoking cessation. Insufficient evidence for, uh, for non-clinical use for the nicotine salt products. There was no available evidence. Um, and obviously there's some work there at the bottom on nicotine exposure. Right. So not really promising findings. Um, and I just published on LinkedIn my opening statement from yesterday's inquiry where I noted there that actually, you know, when we look at people who have who are currently smoking and using e-cigarettes. So the, the narrative from the vaping industry is actually they're probably using both things at the same time while they're still quitting smoking and then they'll gradually get off the smokes. Um, that's what industry and pro-vaping advocates will often say when we say, well, hang on a minute, actually people are using both their dual users and they'll say, don't worry about that. It's just because they are using both while they quit and then they'll quit. So we actually have research that shows that when we look at those people who are dual users, 55% will still be dual users two years later. So they are still smoking and using e-cigarettes two years later. Only 12% will have successfully transitioned. Sorry, actually, I got that completely wrong. 55% will go back to just normal smoking. They won't quit. They'll give up the e-cigs and they'll go back to smoking. 
And then 12% will, um, only 12% will actually quit smoking successfully and transition to um, to sole e-cigarette use. So they're still using something. They're not using nothing. But essentially, the vast majority of, of smokers who are using these products to, to quit or who are using both products will end up just going back to smoking. These are not that panacea for smoking cessation that, that people think it is. Um, so this is what I was alluding to. E-cigarettes might be beneficial for smokers, but only if they use them completely and promptly to quit. But most don't. They will transition back to exclusive smoking or just use continue using both for the rest of their lives. Uh, we also have some evidence that says former smokers who use e-cigarettes are more than twice as likely to relapse. And the only research finding any benefit of e-cigarettes that I'm aware of was in the context of behavioural support. So this isn't just give people an e-cig and off you go. They're interacting with doctors in the UK. They're interacting with the NHS's Stop Smoking Service. So they're getting that behavioural support as well. It's really hard to tease apart you know, the, um, the extent to which e-cigarettes on their own are helpful. And then the health harms. So um, we do know this is, again, from, the, from Banks's, Emily Banks's report. We do know that e-cigarette use is associated with poisoning and toxicity, lung injury and burns. We know they contain chemicals that are carcinogenic. Uh, the nicotine obviously causes dependence, and I've spoken already about the nicotine salt versus freebase nicotine. Um, but also important to, to note that the harms aren't just associated with nicotine, it's also associated with additives. So, you know, in some respects, Australia's obsession with nicotine has been problematic. You know, we've used the fact that nicotine is a poison to be able to hold steady on e-cigarettes for so long. Other countries haven't been so lucky because nicotine isn't a poison in those countries. Uh, we've been able to use that, but I think a side effect of that has been that people don't realise that the non-nicotine ones are actually harmful as well. So we need to be doing definitely more in that space. And finally, gateway to smoking. Non-smokers who use e-cigarettes are three times more likely than those who avoid them to initiate tobacco smoking. And in terms of youth in particular, there's strong evidence that never smokers who use e-cigarettes are more likely than those who don't to initiate smoking and to become current smokers. So there's a real risk there that these products will just eliminate all of the hard work that we've been doing for decades in Australia. So onto the how, um, we talk about sort of behaviour change, but, you know, I think if anything in this space, the behaviour that we've been trying to change has been the behaviour of the decision makers and politicians and policy makers. Um, you know, we're not at that stage necessarily just yet where we need to be intervening at the individual level. Obviously, education campaigns are great and, you know, there will be education campaigns around e-cigarettes and there, and there has been. There was one launched by VicHealth a couple of days ago with the with Quick Team. But actually, you know, it's changing the behaviour of politicians uh, and what they see. So in terms of advocacy, how exactly did we do this? I cannot emphasise enough how coordinated we were around this. So it was absolutely critical that we all sung from the same song sheet, hymn sheet, whatever you want to call it. Um, so many years ago, you know, well, actually, and it's still impacting today, there was, a you know, plans for a national obesity strategy and one of the reasons that really didn't get up was because you had the nutrition people saying nutrition's important. You had the physical activity people saying physical activity is important. And the, the politician just went, oh, well, you know, you guys essentially sort your shit out and before you come to us. And so we wanted to make sure when it came to e-cigarettes that we were a lot more coordinated. So, you know, we met amongst ourselves before meeting with politicians and policymakers. Um, you know, when we were making submissions to government consultations, we would make joint submissions or, you know, um, I would check in with cancer councils and go, hey, just want to make sure that what I'm putting in matches what you guys are putting in um, so we're on the same page. There's also a lot of uh, commentary and blog pieces that I've written and others have written for the conversation and for pursuit and also to sort of reach audiences that you don't often reach with research is, you know, podcasts, radio and TV, which is what we call sort of softening the ground. When it comes to dealing with politicians and policymakers, they don't do stuff that's not going to get them elected. So part of what we do is actually needing to reassure them that any policies or reforms that they decide to put in place is actually going to be pretty popular. Um, and so that's why we need to get to 
the everyday people, the community, because that drums up support for policy change. And I don't think it's a coincidence that we're seeing changes in reforms you know, at the same time as parents and teachers are coming out and very loudly saying, we have a problem here, right? I've been trying to say this since 2017 and no one's listened to me. Um, so it's it's because we reached the community and they and the politicians realised that this wasn't something that was going to get them chucked out of um, chucked out of government. So when it came to meeting uh, and emailing politicians and policymakers, I am not ashamed to say that I was very annoying. I, anytime I publish something new, I would email or I'd flick it through to, to relevant contacts. But it was important not just to flick through, you know, a paper that they might struggle to understand. I produced infographics that sort of really synthesised the content into a digestible sort of um, one page back and front. Here is what we know about tobacco control and this is what we need to do about it. And so this particular infographic that I've got on the slide right now, that was... Um, you know, it also came out at that perfect time and, and I didn't, that wasn't planned on my part. It's sort of something that was lucky enough to happen. It happened just before the sort of 10th anniversary of the plain packaging. Um, I just happened to send it through to the Federal Department of Health uh, right when they were also synthesising all the evidence from the, the review that they'd been doing for years um, and they were able to use this piece as well to, to leverage um, the the. Uh, Mark Butler in this space. There's also advocacy in terms of emails. So he, this is an email that I sent to um, Roger Cook, who's minister in WA, you know, urging their party to adopt a tobacco-free um, WA, a 10-point plan. So, you know, emailing them, this is the letter that I, that I sent through. Um, and also, again, ACOSH, the Australian Council on Speaking Health, developed an infographic. So, you know, that letter... You know, sure, it's important, but at the end of the day, they want something that they can just really hold on to, and you know, that's that's that looks pretty, really. And then submissions to government consultations. It was really important that these were, you know, in in terms of encouraging behaviour change, that these were really clear, compelling, and concise. Had to be evidence based. So, you know, lots of references for what we were saying. This is, you know, this is a harmful product. Reference, reference, reference. Um, we want to make it as easy as possible for them. So, you know, any questions that were based or that were in the consultation, it was the question was repeated, bolded, and then the relevant response was underneath that question, right? Um, we didn't, I certainly didn't respond to any questions that were outside my scope of expertise. And again, this is very coordinated. So um, moving on now to blogs and commentary pieces. This is these are just a few that I've um, written in in recent years in response to what's happening in the uh, e-cigarette space. So really clear takeouts, jargon free, very audience specific as well. So you know you know you need to know if you're dealing with people who might have some knowledge of this versus the general community who might not. Um, a few puns in there too. And then the radio, television stuff, again, very clear, very compelling. A few key points that were made frequently and they were repeated. So I have been saying the same thing on radio for six, seven years. I know exactly what I'm going to go into a radio interview saying. I know the point I'm going to get across and I just keep repeating it over and over. And again, timing was everything. So, you know, if we knew that something was coming up or that the government was considering action, then, you know, we are putting pieces out there, trying to get on the radio, doing as much as possible so that the government felt like they were supported in that space. The other thing that I try to do in radio interviews, TV interviews, whenever I can, is preempt backlash or counter arguments. So here's a couple that we get quite a bit. Um, don't you want smokers to have the best chance of quitting? And so my usual response to that is, well, e-cigarette products are unapproved and so they must be used under medical supervision. Smokers who genuinely want to quit smoking have access to these products via their GP. Visiting their GP provides an opportunity to receive behavioural support, which is the gold standard for smoking cessation. The other one we get a lot of is why are cigarettes still allowed when they are less harmful? And I'll say, well, we made a mistake with cigarettes. We don't want to make the same mistake with e-cigarettes. 
And we shouldn't be making e-cigarettes more available. We should be making cigarettes less available. And I used this argument yesterday in the inquiry because, you know, we had the pro vapors who were saying, you know, we cannot believe that a less harmful product is not available and a more harmful product is. And that is just so short-sighted. Um, it's like introducing the, the cane toad to deal with beetles. Like, and now we have a problem with cane toads. It, 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 it just doesn't work. So, you know, we have these counter arguments ready to go just in case there's a shred of, you know, um, concern or confusion in the general community around this. Um, a few words, and then I think there's, I'm going to leave lots of time for questions. This really didn't come easy. And I mean, like I said, yesterday at the inquiry, the other side was there and, you know, just the degree to which they are misleading government representatives is actually quite astonishing. Um, we've got industry front groups operating in Australia. So uh, Responsible Vaping Australia, which is, um, funded by British American Tobacco, Legalised Vaping Australia, which is funded by Philip Morris International. We've got vested interests that we're dealing with as well. So the Australian Association of Convenience Stores who are really pushing for vaping products to be sold in the convenience stores um, that you know their members uh, are a part of. So we're talking, for example, 7-Eleven here. Um, I want it on the record that I'm not saying 7-Eleven is currently doing anything illegal. What I'm saying is that these convenient, the Australian Association of Convenience Stores, of which 7-Eleven is a member, is arguing for why they should be allowed to sell these products, right? They don't like it when I um, use their name, but they should be not arguing for the wrong thing. Um, and then I won't mention them. So just wanted to make that clear. Uh, AstroTurfing campaigns as well. So, you know, they'll make it really easy for members of the community, particularly vapors, to, you know, click a button and um, fill in your details and that'll go straight to the government, you know, when there's an inquiry taking place. So we've recently done some work on submissions to government consultations and as much as 30% of them are from AstroTurfing campaigns that um, have been led by you know, Philip Morris International, British American Tobacco. We then have the Australian Tobacco Harm Reduction Association. So members, um, well, it has no members. It has directors, but it has no members. Uh, they're the directors write countless opinion pieces. They have a very strong media presence. They're very loud. They are meeting with politicians. They are tagging politicians online on their Twitter feed. They, um, they weren't represented yesterday in the inquiry, but their former director was there. This association, when it was starting up, actually received funding from the vaping industry. And we know that some of one of the directors in particular has also received funding from, from the tobacco industry. I'm not going to name names, but, you know, if, if the Australian Tobacco Harm Reduction Association is coming out saying this stuff, it's easy to see why members of the general community get confused um, and think that this is a legitimate organisation. There is limited or no declarations of industry funding. Uh, certainly, we know with the most recent TGA um, TGA inquiry, uh, there was some background research done with, which found that uh, some of the submissions from people or groups with known industry funding, they didn't declare that. So, you know, there was some work done to inform the TGA and the TGA has then since gone to those, um, those submitters and said, you know, it's come to our attention that you may have not fully disclosed please let us know what's happening. Um, and then, of course, as I mentioned earlier, the government revolt led by the nationals who received donations from Big Tobacco. So here is an example of the AstroTurfing campaign. This is a Facebook post from Responsible Vaping Australia. No mention at all that Responsible Vaping Australia is funded by British American Tobacco. So you could click on that link and it would take you directly to fill in your details and sends off that, um, that submission to the government saying that you want products, these products to be available everywhere. So I, I can't remember the exact figures, but I think the most recent TGA consultation had about 4,000 submissions. Um, and all of those 4,000 submissions, about 3,900 came from, you know, vested interests and, and these astroturfing campaigns. On to government donations. So this uh, pretty picture here is of Holly Hughes, who led the or chaired the Senate Harm Reduction Committee that I alluded to. This is the second one done in 2020, which I had the pleasure of being grilled at by Holly Hughes and, and Matt Canavan. 
Um, and so this piece in the Fin Review um, exposed their uh, the money trail behind it. Essentially, that they were that Big Tobacco is was was behind that that committee potentially allegedly. Here are the government donations I was talking about earlier. So the National Party and the Liberal Democratic Party still the only parties to currently. Uh, be accepting industry donations, uh, tobacco and vaping industry, uh, tobacco, um, you know, BAT, PMI. Um, interesting, what I want to point out is um, the size of those donations. So before 2016, 2017, those donations were up 15,000, 10,000, you know, whatever. But once e-cigarettes hit the market and once, you know, those inquiries, so the first inquiry was around 2017, 2018, and then obviously the most recent inquiry was 2020, 2021, but we've had, you know, inquiries or consultations being done throughout that whole time in tobacco control. Those donations have doubled, if not tripled. We've got massive donations happening to government right around the time that they are considering policy changes. This is not a coincidence. And, you know, I don't think I have to tell you that these two parties support the legalization of e-cigarettes, right? Vicky Campion, um, who is Barnaby Joyce's partner, I believe, this is what she recently said about the reforms, that vaping crackdown is all about tax revenue. There's such an easy punching bag for the government that they will not miss their opportunity to once again demonize nicotine addicts in the budget. And to that, I say that actually, use of the term nicotine addicts is demonizing. Um, so really terrible language to use there. That's certainly not language that, that we would ever use to describe smokers. Like I mentioned, the undisclosed funding, this is ATHRA, the Tobacco Harm Reduction Association. Um, they now disclose on their website that they received startup funding from the vaping industry. It, it took a lot to get them to do that. Um, and it was exposed on 60 Minutes, I believe. I don't have that footage, but it is wonderful footage to, to check out um, with one of their directors, you know, being told, hang on a minute, you, you know, you have, um, there's a conflict here. Here's the board of directors of ATHRA at the moment uh, on the left. Here is an example of uh, a recent piece published by some of those directors um, which criticised the NHMRC statement on e-cigarettes. Now, what I've got there on the screen is just their conflicts of interest, right? That's not even the article. Most, some, there are some articles that are about the length of that conflict of interest statement. Um, and... Also, it's, I mean, it's important to stay on top of this um, because often, you know, this is the most, one of the most comprehensive ones that I've seen, but this is not what they write all the time. And certainly when they've published pieces in the, in the media, I've had to, you know, chat to editors um, and say, hang on a minute, you know, did you know, for instance, that Dr. Mendelssohn travelled to Dubai to speak on a panel at the World Vape Show about how vaping products can reduce smoking and health? He didn't declare that. I contacted the editor and then that statement at the bottom appeared um, that the show covered his travel and accommodation expenses. So what does this all mean? Essentially, we did get there, but there are powerful forces that are already attempting to undermine the reforms. Um, like I mentioned, vaping inquiry yesterday, that was, that was most apparent. A lot of misinformation happening a lot of media clickbait. So this is a, a, a title of a piece that came out the day that the reforms were announced. Australia's new vape crackdown divides scientists. It really doesn't. You know, the vast majority of us agree on these products and, and the way that they should be handled. It's just a very loud minority that doesn't. So yesterday, an open letter went out to Minister Butler um, that was, you know, signed by apparently 41 experts in tobacco control We've looked at those experts. They are not experts in tobacco control. You know, five of them, I think you could say, are legitimate experts in tobacco control. The remaining are not experts at all. They have very little idea what they're talking about. But this is the sort of stuff that's being used to, you know, say that, you know, scientists are divided when they're not. So to end, we mustn't be complacent. I hate to say this because I'm absolutely exhausted, but the fight has only just begun. And I have left 15 minutes for questions. I'm really sorry I took so long. So happy to happy to answer any questions. I might stop sharing actually so I can see everyone's faces.
Hey, Michelle, thank you so much for that. That's, uh, as you said, the, the, the fight has just begun and you've made me very worried <laughs> about the long list of actions that you've already taken, uh, especially if this is now only just the beginning. It's become clear that there's a lot of vested interest in this domain and that they will not go down without a fight. That much has become clear. Now, yeah. I have a couple questions in the chat. Let me read them out to you. This one's from Daniel. What research is there on the negative health effects that e-cigarettes have compared to that of normal cigarettes? So back to the fundamentals, I guess. Yeah, and um, so we we all agree that these products shouldn't be available to children. So you'll find that um, the pro-vaping groups do say, look, let's... What we disagree on is the manner in which we think we should approach that problem. So we all agree, you know, kids getting this isn't good. The flavorings, you know, the, certainly the unicorn milk flavorings, we should get rid of that. There's still some argument with the pro vaping side who believe that some of the flavorings should be allowed, uh, um, you know, for whatever reason. Uh, they claim it helps with smoking cessation. There's no evidence of that. Um, and obviously they or they also agree that these products shouldn't have, you know, unicorns on them. So they do agree with um, some of the restrictions and reforms that have been put in place. Where we disagree is that they believe these things can be put in place without the import ban um, or without sort of, um, they believe these things can work within a consumer model. We don't believe that because we know what industry is like. We know what happens when we let them do stuff, particularly in the alcohol space. Um, so we really don't want to sort of give them that inch because we know they'll take a mile. But there are certain there are certainly areas in which we, we, we agree. So realistically, uh, and I'm a complete rookie in this space, but what is the evidence that a cigarette is significantly worse than an e-cigarette? Or are they all both just incredibly harmful? No, there's no evidence um, that I'm aware of that says e-cigarettes are more harmful than tobacco cigarettes. So based on the available evidence to date, which is based on short-term markers of health, not long-term markers of health, it, it is looking like e-cigarettes are less harmful than tobacco cigarettes. Okay. Um, so, you know, we, I, I can fairly confidently say that based on the evidence to date. Our concern is that when it came to, when it comes to smoking, over time, the the way in which that smoking damages the body just it, it happens very slowly. It's and we we see the clinical markers of damage that doesn't become cancer until 20, 30 years. It doesn't become a diagnosis of cancer for another 20, 30 years. We don't want to wait 20, 30 years to find out if e-cigarettes cause cancer. But what we do know is that the chemicals in them are cytotoxic and are carcinogenic. So we're sort of thinking, yes, in 30 years' time, there's a chance that they will, but let's not take that chance. Fair enough, especially Correct. not with children. Correct. Um, Correct. So you mentioned that you, there is a quote here, that you got people to sing from the same hymn sheet. Lovely yep. quote. There's a new one for me. Um, as you said, that there's been effort with other health issues where it's not really worked because, you know, as you said, no, it's nutrition, no, it's exercise. You fire yep. that amongst yourselves and by that stage, the campaign is gone um what can so i guess realistically how did you manage with this specific problem to actually avoid that problem because you you mentioned that you know you got together you you fought it out amongst yourselves beforehand and then you actually were very very effective but how do you fight it out before you're like amongst yourselves beforehand there's there's a, there's a couple steps missing there which i think most um yeah, scientists here would like to know. <laughs> I think, I mean, we were really lucky in the e-cigarette space that there wasn't a need to sort of fight it out. Mm -hmm. You know, when it came to the major health organisations, the credible ones anyway in Australia, mm -hmm. we were all on the same page with this. So when we met beforehand, it wasn't necessarily about fighting it out. It was what, what are we asking for exactly? What are the exact words that we're going to use? What are, what are the levers that we're going to say here? So, for instance, I might go into a submission and say, well, I think that, you know, we need to ban products or, you know, ban these products. And then Cancer Council might come and say, you know, to help government, you should say, you know, that banning these products under this act, under this legislation. So that's what I mean by singing from the same 
him sheet and, and, and having a coordinated approach. So we all knew what we wanted. It was just making sure we got the language right and that we were all coming to government, telling them, providing advice as to what levers in terms of legislation and various tobacco control acts they could pull in this space. Gotcha. Uh, Chris would like to know, and I, I think you've already answered this in the first question, but do you actually have any common ground with yeah. more pro-vaping groups well, in terms of uh, plain packaging and marketing restrictions? That seems that you do. Hmm? Yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, like I mentioned earlier, we all agree that these shouldn't be um, allowed for children. You know, we all agree that these products shouldn't be very colourful and shouldn't have cartoons on them. Um, so there is common ground on those sort of restrictions. Gotcha. Uh, I've got a trench coat of questions from Alex. And with trench coat, I mean one trench coat, three uh, kids hiding in it. Um, so first, has there been research on vape usage for under 18s uh, at all? So is, is that a very common trend for under under 18s to vape? Yeah, so the the latest, um, so there's National Drug Strategy Household Survey. There's also the Australian Secondary Schools Survey. The secondary school survey is quite dated now. It's 2017, so it was out in the field last year. So we're expecting results and prevalence rates to come through there and to come through um, the NDSHS, which also does 14-plus-year-olds. We're expecting that to come through. Um, I can't give you the exact percent because, again, it's very dated, um, but what we do know is there was a tripling of use in that 12-plus um, age group Um since 2013. I don't think there's been anything done um, in use under 12s uh, in terms of prevalence rates. So um, uh, you are reading the same chat. Excellent. Yeah, it's um, <laughs> it's it's the 14, 14 plus tends to be the sort of limit in terms of the prevalence. Um, I'll answer the second question around addictiveness. You know, that's a really, that's a really tricky one. Um, so definitely going to the, the GP if you can to, to sort of have a look at what support there might be. I wrote a conversation piece recently on how parents can support teens to quit to quit. It's sort of that piece sort of relies on the kids not being addicted just yet. So it more focuses on behavioural strategies like setting goals and if then planning and motivation. Um, if they are addicted, then it probably does require some sort of medical intervention, uh, a tapering off. So you certainly wouldn't cut off the nicotine straight away. You might want to work on ways of, of sort of reducing the nicotine content. I did go to a, a presentation recently conducted by one of the children's hospitals uh, who talked about the potential to use um, nicotine patches. Um, I can't speak to that, but there are certainly um, potential products out there who can, uh, that can, that can assist in this space if they are addicted, that is. Okay, fair enough. Uh, Kali would like to know, how can we better engage young people in research, decision-making bodies, uh, et cetera, as we've, uh, for transparency for everyone who's now here, uh, we did have a conversation with Michelle just beforehand when we check the technology that she uh, did her PhD studying uh, eating behaviors in, in children, and that there is, especially nowadays, a lot of red tape around doing research with younger people. So I think Michelle will have quite a bit to say around this topic. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, I mean, certainly conducting research sort of on kids is is tricky especially if you're going through the school-based system um you know there we would love to have more young people involved in our research um as in involved in our research teams and driving things and it, it's I think there's definitely that's what um funding bodies are pushing now to have consumer advisory groups who are saying this is what we want to do um they're really really tricky to set up so unfortunately, most of the research I've done so far has been, you know, not, I'll admit it hasn't been co-designed in the traditional sense of the co-design word. So I will run focus groups with kids and I'll say, look, what messages do you think we should develop? Can you help us develop them? So they'll help us sort of with what messages will work, but that's the extent of their involvement. Mm -hmm. um, but so I, I do think then there's there's a greater need certainly to be involving kids, not just in, in the e-cigarette space, but in any research that affects them. But that comes with consumer research anyway. There should be a lot more, um, there should be a lot more engagement there. And, you know, I think that's that's um, something that the universities definitely need to get, definitely need to get better at. I think some medical institutions, um, research institutions do that better than universities um, in terms of setting up consumer advisory groups. Yeah. Okay. 
fair enough. Um, another question from Grace. You mentioned that you are focusing on a governmental slash policy level intervention approach to start with. Is there a plan for the approach to shift to include more individual level interventions in the future? So think of smart nudges and eye nudges, if you will. Hmm? Yeah, so we have not been focusing on the individual. I mean, we have, but we haven't put all our focuses there because the way we see it is if we don't stem the flow of these products entering the country, we're constantly going to be paying, playing catch up with any individual level intervention. So the way we've sort of thought about it is rather than sink millions of dollars into a mass media campaign, an education campaign or individual interventions, let's remove the harmful product to begin with. So that's where we've direct, been directing a lot of our efforts. But, you know, having said that, there have been some education campaigns that have come out there to try and get at the individual stuff while the government was trying to figure out what it was doing. Um, in the most recent announcement, Mark Butler did also announce $63 million, uh, in funding for vaping and tobacco control campaigns. So we will certainly see more of that individual level stuff in terms of education happening mm -hmm. in the future. Um, but we are also seeing, um, you know, more funding being directed at schools as well to support this, which, you know, I think schools have enough to deal with. Um, I, 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 I hate that it's it's up to the individual to, to have to change their behaviour sometimes. Um, but, you know, we are getting some additional funding in that space, which is good to see. All right. Uh, question from Adeline, what lessons have we learned from behavior change techniques and smoking cessation that we can also apply to vaping? Uh, and are they different or are they actually very similar challenges? Yeah, we don't have much research on um, how to manage the, well, there aren't any resources anyway out there that I could find enough because I looked into it when I wrote that conversation piece around how do we, you know, deal with, or how do we approach behaviour change in terms of vaping. So the piece that I put together took a lot of lessons from the tobacco control space um, and how we, how we deal with quit smoking. So, you know, making sure people are motivated to quit, uh, if then uh, implementation intentions, if then planning, um, setting smart goals, monitoring, um, having alternative substitutes in place, uh, finding out is something I talked a lot about is, you know, working on as well, taking the time to figure out what the reason behind the particular in, uh, use is. So is it that they're addicted, in which case there's one approach that you have to take, or is it that you know, vaping is a way of them socialising with friends. That's certainly something we've heard in the focus groups is they said, you know, smokers these days, you know, if you're the smoker, then you have to go outside and you're on your own. But actually vaping, it's usually everyone in a friendship group that's vaping. So you, it's not like, oh, I'm, I'm getting away from my friends. So it's really hard, that sort of social norm stuff. So it's really, this behaviour really sort of has has thrown has thrown us somewhat, but, you know, what is it that, that what's the reason why kids are using? Um, certainly something as well that we've heard is, you know, kids are using for anxiety or, or um, because they, you know, believe it helps with their mental health. So that really speaks to, we need to be doing more for kids' mental health. Um, and, and it also speaks to, we don't want to suddenly remove a product that someone is using to emotionally regulate. So, taking the time to find out exactly why someone is using the product and making sure you're building in um, safeguards to then successfully change behaviour later. Okay. Uh, I think uh, with, with this last question, I mean, you, you've already alluded to it as one of the many reasons why people may use uh, a vape. I've, I've never heard it compared to a, to a fidget spinner in terms of anxiety control, but here we are. Um, we'll close out with this uh, question and comment uh, or observation made by Kami, where e-cigarettes are probably very popular because they are perceived as being very cool. Everyone's doing it. They seem to be very cool, where she expresses concerns that if there is a ban on them, the illegality of them will make them even more cool. How, how do you feel about that statement? Yeah, no, that's that's come up as well. You know, people have said if, if you ban something, then it just makes it, you know, forbidden fruit. Kids want to rebel. Um, I mean, I, do, I, I agree with it, but I also think that if we really nail the enforcement at the border so that these products aren't as accessible as they are now, then that will go some way to helping it. Um, I think the vaping is cool thing it would be, um, 
I think it would come up as a problem if we weren't doing the bands and we were just doing education. Mm. I think if we, because we're doing both at the same time, that'll help with the the forbidden fruit, um, you know, accessibility of it. That's my off the cuff thought there. Fair enough. All right. Well, Michelle, thank you so much. Uh, actually, I'm, I'm not sure why I'm closing this one out. Adeline, are you closing this one out? <laughs> There you go, Freya. That's great. <laughs> okay. Then. Well, <laughs> thanks so much for so having much. me. Well, it was an absolute pleasure to to have you. Consider me educated because I uh, I'm really not at home in the e-cigarette space. I uh, I I don't know what it is about me, but I smell the stuff and it makes me ill to my stomach. Um. So thank you much for for educating me and educating the the many other great participants we have on the line. Everyone. Uh, Online, thank you so much for your absolutely great questions. There were some really interesting comments, really interesting questions in there. Um, and stay, you know, stay in tune or stay up to date or stay up to date with Michelle's great work. I'll definitely be keeping out an eye, um, also distinguishing the good associations from the bad associations, because it seems to be surprisingly little difference, given that they refuse to disclose the difference. Yeah. <laughs> but, and, you know, customer, consumer, beware. And as always, we hope to see you again uh, in about a month's time where we're going to talk about another very hot topic, which is how people make decisions regarding their mortgages. Mm -hmm. And in this economic climate, a very, very scandalous topic indeed. But then again, to close us out with, Michelle, thank you so much. Great. Thank you so thank much, you, guys. Thanks, Mella. Bye, everyone. Have a thank good night, you. everyone.